Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us today for another NACTA webinar. My name is Dana Leroy. I'm the Communications Manager at NACTA. And from the National Office staff, we hope that you and your families and your staff are continuing to stay healthy and stay safe at home. I know many of us are still trying to process the impact of our news from last week with convention being canceled, you know, our staff included. But we want you to know that we are here for all of our members across all of our associations, and we are working very hard to provide you related content and opportunities for us to connect during this time that we can't physically be together. So please, I encourage you to continue to reach out to us with your ideas and your favorite convention memories or whatever it is that we can help you with, um, because we truly are all in this together, and we're going to get through these tough times together. We are all anxiously looking forward to our next real game day. And so today's session is called Planning for Game One in a COVID-19 World. We are fortunate to have David Malay of Engagement here with us to lead this conversation. David leads the day-to-day -day business and growth of Engagement, which is a customer and employee experience design firm. Prior to co-founding Engagement, David helped to build Disney Institute ventures into the sports market, working with collegiate organizations. Very quickly today, before we get started, for today's live attendees, you're probably familiar with this by now, but if you do have a question during the webinar, you may send it through the questions drop-down window on the webinar dashboard. We will be addressing your questions periodically throughout the presentation. And as a reminder, a recording of the webinar as well as the presentation slides will be made available to all NACTA and affiliates members via the NACTA Daily Review. And with that, I'm going to step aside for a bit and I'll turn things over to David to kick us off. All right, thank you, Dana. Um, so first of all, uh, this is a pretty weird setup for me. Um, if those of you that know me uh, know whenever I'm working with a group, uh, we like to ask a lot of questions and get into it. So I'm gonna try to do that here. So you guys should engage back with me as well. The more questions you ask, the better this is going to go because I'm definitely not Tony Robbins and definitely not sitting down in a chair. I'm not going to be as good as Tony Robbins. So um, before we jump in, though, I, I do want to give a thanks to Dana and Bob and, and Chris Green and uh, the whole NACTA family uh, for having me out uh, to to do this with you guys. Um, my first, I guess my first week out of college, quick story, uh, my first week on the job, if you will, uh, at Disney, Disney Institute, was NACTA down in Orlando. Uh, and that was like my, hey, welcome to the professional world. This is what it's going to be like. And for those of you that have been to NACTA Live, obviously, um, that being my first venture into the professional world, I was like, hell yeah, this is way better than college. Um, this is It's work and fun and play all at the same time. Uh, the following week, I, I crashed back into reality into my gray office cubicle. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, NACTA always holds a special place in my heart. Um, so I just want to thank you guys all for being members, um, and thanks to the NACTA family for, for having us out here. Um, so a little bit on engagement, who we are. Um, before we get started, I, I kind of want to give you some backdrop into that. So our, our founding members of engagement really all kind of have that Disney background. So I came from Disney Institute. Uh, one of our other partners, Mike Malay, uh, came from ESPN Wide World of Sports. Uh, he was the head executive there. And so for those of you that are familiar with that complex, everything from event ops to marketing to finance uh, teed up into him, if you will. So he kind of brings that strategic side uh, to the business, whereas I mainly play on the experience design side. And our, our third partner is Rick Jones, who while he never worked at Disney, uh, he might be more creative than anybody that I know from uh, from Disney, if you will. Uh, so he really plays on the sponsorship side. And so between the three of us, as we looked at creating engagement, um, a lot of the things that I was getting at Disney Institute were uh, asks to go deeper, if you will. So great work, Disney Institute, you're helping us with customer service and leadership and culture, but we really want deeper customer experience pieces. So how do we look at the holistic customer journey um, and how do we make improvements to it, whether that be looking at pricing models for tickets, whether that be uh, creating new internal systems for communication, whatever it might be around experience, um, can you go deeper? And at Disney Institute, we weren't willing to do that. Uh, so we started engagement to go ahead and uh, and meet the needs of our market, if you will. Um, so with that, we'll kind of jump in. 
All right, let's hit next on the slide. There we go. All right, so here's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, really mainly three things. So the three things are, what is design thinking? Second thing is how to create customer personas. And the third thing is plan by using customer journey maps. So ultimately we wanna get you guys prepared for the first game back from COVID-19. And from our time at Disney, what I learned was the best way to plan is to ultimately plan around who is your customer. And when we talk about who is your customer, some of you might be on today's webinar and you might not be in a marketing or an ops or an external facing position. Some of you might be in a position where you work with student athletes. Uh, some of you might be on more of the internal side of things, serving employees. So anytime we say customer today, I want you to change your lens from thinking about it as a fan to really thinking about it as a human that you serve. Um, so again, that could be a student athlete, could be an employee. Uh, for the purposes of today, we are going to mainly put it through the lens of a fan, but you can alternatively uh, use that word customer and swap it for anybody else that you serve. Um, so these three things of what is design thinking, how to create customer personas, and plan by using customer journey maps. By us going through kind of a high level overview of what these three things are, why they're important to you, and how to use them, you're gonna be better prepared to actually plan for game one. Um, I've had a lot of calls with different athletic administrators over the last month or so since we've been locked up in this freaking house. Um, and everybody's kind of feeling the same thing where you've got some downtime on your hands and everybody's doubling down on content right now. But one of the silver linings of COVID-19 shutting all of our sports down is that I do think a lot of us just run from event to event to event. And there's not enough time to plan ahead for the next one. Um, so because of that, it, I feel like there's not, um, uh, not everyone has a, an equal footing as to how to plan going forward. So we're gonna give you just a quick, easy tool uh, in these customer journey maps that will allow you to better plan, create enhancements, and uh, make a better experience for fans when we get back uh, on game one. All right, so the first portion of this, what is design thinking? All right, so the what and why behind design thinking. Ultimately, design thinking is a set of principles for creative problem solving. So when you think about your iPhone or my Fitbit watch that I'm wearing, this microphone, uh, your computer, uh, maybe the building that's next to you, uh, design thinking is really a set of principles that is used to apply uh, to create all kinds of products, uh, services, or offerings uh, for a customer, if you will. Um, when you think about design thinking, it's also one way to think about it is human-centered design or being customer centric. And again, replace customer with anybody that you're serving. Um, ultimately, what it does is it's, it's a literal set of tools that you can have in your toolbox that you can pull out and use in a, in a sense of time as you're planning. So design thinking ultimately should allow you to come up with ideas faster. It's gonna help give you more ideas. So there's a concept of converging, which is going out and diverging going in, right? Uh, actually, it's the other way around, diverging, going out, converging, coming in. Um, and so ultimately, you want to come up with as many ideas as possible and then whittle those down. And design thinking is going to help you do that. Um, it's also going to help you have less mistakes and higher adoption. So by placing yourself in the shoes of the customer and making the customer front of mind, being customer centric, you're not going to have as many um, mistakes in your offerings or things that just don't resonate with customers. How many of you have thought, hey, this is gonna be the perfect service or, um, or product for our customers only to see it fall flat on your face. Well, design thinking really, the process of it helps you eliminate those mistakes, if you will. All right, so high level about design thinking, um, it's really focused on empathy. And that's really the key word throughout this whole process. And as you're planning for game one, it's about taking a look at your customer and putting yourself in their shoes. So this fan right here in, this, in the crowd, right? What is he thinking? What's his background? What's his job? How much money does he make? Does he have a family? What does he care about? Does he like craft beer? Does he like hard alcohol? Um, all of those things come into play when you're starting to really plan and create new opportunities um, to engage with your fans. Um, so the other thing here is that design thinking really is 
is created to help you break out of your river of thinking, if you will. So oftentimes, how many, how many of you have gone into a meeting or a new department with someone and you have this, this conversation with someone where you suggest an idea and quickly it gets shot down because, oh, that won't work here and here's why. Um, because we have expertise in our areas, we become closed-minded to new opportunities because we're so set in, well, this is what has worked for me. Um, this is my background. I know these, these, uh, the things that are facing me. So what happens is your expertise creates a, a lens or a filter that which you see everything through. So what design thinking does by having empathy for that customer and putting yourself in that customer's shoes, it allows you to take your lens of expertise off and come at the same problem from a different angle, uh, which ultimately allows you to create more ideas. Um, so we're gonna get into a little bit now about planning for game one. This is a high level overview on design thinking. Um, we did not make this up by any means. Uh, there are, if you go type into Google and you search design thinking, engagement might come up as like the 300th item uh, in that Google search. Um, you're gonna see all sorts of things from Google, from Netflix. A company called IDEO is a great resource if you wanna learn more about design thinking. That's I-D-E-O. Um, it, you'll be able to find all kinds of toolkits and different principles that can help you with this in addition to the ones that we're gonna talk about today. All right, so planning for game one. Uh, first advice, get a team. Do not try this alone. Uh, you might be the only one from your department watching this webinar, but I cannot stress this enough. If you only are trying to solve for game day and game one by yourself, it's going to be hard because you're going to have that lens and there's not going to be anybody else to help pull you out of your river of thinking. Um, and you're only going to be able to see it from your level of expertise. But by bringing it together a team of people from marketing, from operations, from sales, people that normally are roadblocks for you when you're proposing ideas down the road, get them in the room with you as you try this out. Um, we've seen tremendous success when that happens, when you, you bring somebody in from the union per se, um, bring them into this conversation uh, as you're trying to create for plan game one instead of creating it in a vacuum and then throwing it downstream. If you do that, people don't understand how you came to those decisions. So get everybody involved early in this process. That would be the first piece of advice as we get started planning. All right, so if you're looking for game one and you're trying to make improvements to your game day, the first piece of advice is really set the goal that you want to target. So ultimately starting with the end in mind. And, and what we mean by that is if your only goal is to improve the game day experience, you're, you're already lost. Um, it, that is the equivalent of saying, I want to lose, I want to lose weight. And when somebody asks you, what do you mean? You just say, Oh, my game plan is, you know, I, I want to, I'm going to go to the gym maybe, or I'm going to, I'm going to diet more. We all know from that analogy, that if you don't set very specific metrics as to how often are you gonna to go to the gym, how much weight do you wanna lose? Why do you wanna lose that weight? Um, if you don't really put those parameters around that goal that you're trying to target, you're not gonna achieve it and you're gonna fall flat because there's no real accountability there. So what we would say is from, uh, if you're trying to improve your game day experience, ultimately set that goal that you wanna target. Is it that you wanna, get your customer service scores up on your surveys up 5%, right? Is it that you wanna receive less angry emails? Um, that might be your goal. And if so, what does less angry emails look like? Is it two less angry emails? Is it 20 less angry emails? So as much definition as you can put around what success looks like, the better off you're gonna be. Um, the next piece in it is really defining the scope. So Game day is one of the most, and I, I've learned this from doing these journey maps uh, firsthand, game day is much more complex than somebody buying a widget online. Your customer journey from the time you see a Facebook ad to the time you buy a desk at Ikea, that journey is, is kind of small, if you will, especially if you're buying something online. For game day, that journey is gigantic. So really define the scope of what you will tackle and what you won't tackle with your group. Are you just trying to improve parking? Are you just trying to improve in stadium? Are you just trying to improve uh, the pregame or postgame 
experience? Are you just trying to experience, improve how they buy tickets? Defining the scope is really gonna help you uh, narrow in and create those, those specific solutions. So the next piece is really being prepared to gather data. Um, so it's not necessarily gathering data just yet, but starting to understand, hey, I know I'm gonna have to call on this person and that person to ultimately plan for this. Um, and when we talk about data, everything has data. You have data on everything, whether or not it's hard data, quantitative data, or if it's just stories or perceptions or anecdotal qualitative data, right? Um, you wanna be able to get those different things. It might even just be a picture of something. Uh, be prepared to gather that data though. All right, Dana, we'll, we'll pause here for questions because we kind of run through a, a, a bunch on the first part. Um, but any, uh, any questions on this first part? Yeah, so can you talk for us a little bit um, about this whole concept of design thinking and where was it created? What, how did it originate? Yeah, so uh, I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but uh, design thinking really, it, it's been around for a number of years. Um, it kind of started out of the, the tech space um, as, it, as it relates to creating quickly new product features, if you will. Um, but then where it's really also kind of gotten a lot of steam and where it kind of almost simultaneously was created was in toy making. Um, so if you if you look at IDEO is one of the leading companies, uh, they've got tons of different case studies on ways that they've been able to, by having a playful mindset, create new offerings, products, services that resonate better with customers. Hope that answers it. You talked, yeah, um, you talked a little bit about, you know, this isn't something that you want to go at alone, especially during this time. Um, mm -hmm. So can you give us some advice about who we should be including on these um, teams to start engaging with this design thinking? For sure. Um, so you want to have decision makers in the room. Um, you want to have people that actually can make the call because the last thing you want to do is spend a bunch of time planning for this. Um, and then you go, it goes to the leader to get, you have to present your plan. Uh, it goes to the leader and then the leader just shoots it down because they didn't go through that same empathetic customer persona process that you're going through. Um, so getting leaders in the room is really important. The other piece that I can't mention enough is look at your, look at your idea process, look at your operation and say, who is it that gives us the most trouble? Right? Who is it that always pushes back on our ideas? Whether it's the chief of police, uh, it, it's usually not someone that works for the athletic department. It's usually a third party partner um, that you normally are just assigning them with tasks. You're not involving them in the idea process. So I, I can't stress enough to involve those third party partners. Um, we're working with a, a client right now and, and the person from that heads up kind of the, the operations of the physical plant, uh, he came into this process and pretty quickly we realized why there were some always some some issues with with that department is because they saw their customer as the athletic department they couldn't give they they were not thinking about the fans as their customer because to them they were a third party and their customer was the athletic department um but by putting their shelves in the shoes of the customers, you started having these guys that were hardline safety and that's the only thing that matters. Now thinking about, well, how do we make fans happy? And so bringing them into this process, going looking at identifying who are the tough naysayers, bring them into that process. Um, but again, this is meant to be a bridge to, to, to ultimately bring together operations, marketing, sales, all the above. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's an awesome answer. We had someone mention, you know, um, healthcare providers bringing in the athletic trainers as well. They're an integral piece of, you know, what what the athletic departments are doing and how they move forward. So definitely a great opportunity to be inclusive heading heading forward. So absolutely, absolutely, uh, yeah. And and this is this becomes a fun process that people are doing it. It's not done on spreadsheets as we're about to get into, um, and and people will it. it uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. It does get sticky. And if you have people that are kind of hard line, uh, black and white type things, this might be an uncomfortable process, but it's useful to bring them in. Cool. Well, let's, um, let's Dana, if no more questions, let's keep it rolling. Sounds good. All right. 
so part two uh, of this, at the core of everything is understanding who it is that you're serving. Again, this could be a student athlete, this could be an employee, this could be a fan. Um, we're gonna call them customers uh, for the sake of this. But ultimately it is about getting to the core of who that person is and planning for their needs. All right, so why should I create a customer persona or a student athlete persona or an employee persona? Um, the average fan is not a real person. He does not exist. Here's what I mean by that. I'll give you an example. Let's say you've got 100 fans. 50 of them are aged 70 and 50 of them are aged 20, right? Well, by that calculation, right, your average fan is gonna be like 45 or something along those lines. And so if you're designing experiences for a 45 year old, you're gonna piss off the 70 year old and the 20 year old. So the average fan, by, by you trying to create one solution, one size fits all for all of your fans, you're going to fail and you're not gonna please anybody by trying to please everybody. So you've got to get specific into who are these actual individual people and create services and products for them. All right, so how can personas help me? Um, ultimately, they're going to give you deeper understanding of what motivates that person. And we can, when we can find out what motivates someone, our lives become a lot easier as operators or anyone trying to do our job. So I'll give you an example on deeper understanding. Um, from our time at, at Disney, um, I guess the last however many years I was there, um, maybe three years or so, four years, uh, they created the Magic Band. Uh, on our podcast, Flip the Switch, we had a guy by the name of Michael Jungin come on, who was one of the creators of that Magic Band. Uh, and he talked about all the benefits behind the scenes and how they created that Magic Band process. The main driver behind the Magic Bands was ultimately to get a deeper understanding of who the customers in a Disney park were. So previous to the Magic Band, they had no way of knowing once you checked out and you bought that plush Mickey doll, they had no way of knowing where you went next. They had no way of knowing that you went and bought dinner right afterwards. And these were the types of things that you ordered. And everything was separate transactions, as opposed to having a clear, deep understanding of who one person was and all of uh, their motivations, goals, and emotions going throughout the day. Um, so by having deeper understanding, you're able to create better uh, services and products for that person more tailored to them. So I know that if somebody's buying a Mickey plush doll, um, I can then market Mickey plush dolls to him after the fact, right? So having that deeper understanding helps you be able to sell and personalize the experience, if you will. Um, it allows for better design, right? A lot of times, uh, I know in, in college athletics, and this happens in pro sports too, but we look at what our peer institutions are doing. Say, oh, our, 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 our neighboring school in the conference came up with this really cool promotion. And when you go to NACTA sometimes, uh, in, in some of the sessions, you'll see people giving up best practices of things that they've done. Um, and while that's good, uh, the best ideas are going to come from a deep, innate understanding of who your fans are, as opposed to just saying, well, that school did it. Surely it'll work for our fans, right? Because that's not always the case because our fan bases are different. Um, and ultimately, this is going to help you get stakeholder buy-in. Uh, I think we've talked at, at length on this on the, on the last question, but bringing uh, different people into the play to look at something visually is going to help them understand why the decision was made to go that route. Um, so you're going to get your ideas approved faster uh, and, and quicker, or quicker and more uh, effectively, if you will, at a higher percentage. All right, so here's what a customer persona is. Uh, this is an example of one on the left. Uh, you can kind of see that it's uh, it's got a picture to it, it's got motivations, it's got pain points, it's got some backgrounds to it. It's bigger and deeper than what you might have from your ticketing team, even if that ticketing team is a great third party, like an Aspire Group or an IMG Learfield Ticket Solutions. Um, so they're gonna have a lot of data, but typically that data is around purchasing power. It's not necessarily around what are those fans looking to do in their lives, if you will. Um, what makes them happy? What makes them sad? And what role can your school play in that, right? Those things aren't captured in, in that data. So ultimately what we're trying to create is a fictional or fictional yet believable uh, person that represents 
someone in your fan base. Um, and you wanna have a deep individual story with them. So this is where you can actually have a little bit of fun and you kind of, sometimes it takes a, someone else to rein everybody in and say, all right, we're getting too carried away with the role play, but give them names, give them stories. What was their life like uh, before they came uh, on campus? What do they like to do for fun? Do they have kids? What sports do their kids play? Well, if their kids play soccer and soccer's happen, soccer happens to be on Saturday, there's a less likelihood that they're going to come to every game, even if they're a season ticket holder. So then you ask the question, right? Or I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but then you ask the question, well, then if they can't come to every game, what's the, the ticket reselling platform look like? So by giving them backstory, you can better cater your offering to them. All right, so what do you include when you're building a fan persona? Here's some types of different things that you wanna put in. You're gonna to wanna to go get some basic demographics. And this is when I might recommend going to your ticket team because they're gonna have a lot of those demographics in terms of typical age, typical uh, income, uh, maybe race even. Uh, really build that story from a demographics perspective. But then you wanna get a little bit deeper is what's their job? What kind of seniority do they have? What's a day in their life look like? Are they a single parent or do they have a stable uh, normal family unit? What do you help her solve? What role does your organization and game day play in their life? Are you trying to make dad, are, are, you, are you able to make dad look like super dad and give them entertainment? Donor can come and entertain his customers. So that way it helps him land new business because he's bringing them into the suite, right? So what problem are you helping solve? I think that's something that is really, really key to include in these personas. Because typically I think we think of game day as just purely entertainment and we're there to entertain people. But that that's surface level, right? You wanna peel back the layers of the onion to say, why are they looking for entertainment? What kind of entertainment are they looking for? What, are the, what do they value most, right? Is it their, their faith and their religion? Is it, uh, is it uh, that they just value loyalty to your brand? Um, do they value ease? Uh, do they, they just have so many things going on, single parent of, of three kids, make it easy for me, right? Or do they value luxury, right? You wanna get into some of these things as to what does the person actually value? This is a, an especially good exercise if you're working with student athletes, because oftentimes I think we, we build these, these great facilities for student athletes, but they're blanket, right? We're, sometimes we don't get into the depths of what is that person specifically looking for? Um, I think coaches tend to do a good job recruiting of this, but I think as we're designing, you know, what does that journey look like for a student athlete when we're recruiting them? This is a question that anybody that they come in contact with should be able to ask. Um, where do they go for information? Are they going on the website? Are they getting it from social media? Where are they looking for that information? Because that's gonna dictate where we communicate them. Um, what are their goals in life, right? Uh, are they trying to get married and, and find their, their next spouse? Uh, are they trying to get a job somewhere? What are their bigger goals in life and how can you play a role in that? Uh, what are their objections to your offering, right? Uh, some people might just, you know, they, they, they hate sports. That's probably not somebody you're going after, right? But you wanna figure out, okay, are they not coming because parking is a pain in the butt? If that's the case, then you gotta go look at your parking uh, situation, right? Um, so these are just some of the things to look at. Again, in, inside gives you a little bit more as well. Daily routines, keywords and phrases they use, who influences them, what brands are they using. The deeper you can go in building the story, the better off you're going to be. All right, how do I create an effective persona? So here's an example of one on the right um, that you're gonna see, but ultimately an effective persona is going to align with business objectives, right? So there's no point in making up a persona for someone that doesn't engage with your brand, right? It's gotta be somebody that by engaging with them is gonna move forward your business objectives. Um, on the flip side too, there's no point in creating a persona that doesn't move the needle for you um, financially if you will, um, if you're talking about fans. Uh, it's really got to align with those business objectives. Go work with your ticket team, right? Get that data, get that research. What's your parking data? What's your concessions and food and beverage data? Factor that into this uh, as, as you play out. Um, bring your personas to life, right? Get a hypothetical picture of what that person looks like and put them up there and make them eye-catching and memorable. 
the more visual you can make it, don't just, you will fail if you put it on a Word document. Uh, really put it together with some different images, different colors and things so that people can actually get a better feel for who this person is and they can see it in their head. It's gonna help you create better products. All right, so if you're planning for game one and you're working on creating a customer persona, um, it can be a struggle because you have so many different types of fans. Same thing on the employee side. If you're working on employee experience, welcoming everybody back into the office, um, where do you start? Everybody, there's so many different types of fans and so many different types of employees. Um, so there's two routes to do this. One is just start singular, pick one that you, you really wanna focus in on. Um, but no matter what you do, don't try to build more than three to four personas. It's gonna be hard enough to build one. Um, do not try to capture everybody. Pick your three to four most, uh, if you're feeling adventurous, pick your three to four most valuable and start there. So uh, get with your ticket team. It might surprise you how much data they actually have. Uh, you know, they've got cool names for things probably in their servers like Donor Dave or Susie Soccer Mom, right? Um, they're going to have some of those terminologies and things already created. Uh, you just don't know that that exists because uh, no one's ever asked them for it. Uh, the next thing is really kind of modal versus money, if, you, if that makes sense. So what we would say is either start with the fan that has the greatest number of fans, so modal being most. Um, if you have 30% of the people in your stadium are season ticket holders at a certain annual donation level, and that's a big group, start with that group. The other way to do it is to start with the fans that have the highest value. So if that's the case, you might be looking at a specific donor group. Um, while they have less fans, they bring in by far the most amount of money. So it might make sense to start with that group. Um, but there's, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Um, these are just some, some tips that we've learned from doing this ourselves with, with other organizations. All right, we'll pause there for, for questions. Okay. Um... Would you agree that this pandemic is going to result in a new kind of customer persona or most certainly alter the ones that we already have? Um, can you just give us some tips on how we serve this new type of customer while remaining empathetic? Yeah, great question. Um, so I don't know that it's going to necessarily result in a new type of customer. I think it's just going to have an extra layer of things we're going to have to take into consideration. We can kind of get into this a little bit when we go into journey maps, where normally you might just be focusing on goals, motivations, preferences, pain points. I think one thing that has to be considered at every touch point is what are their health and health and safety fears at all of these points. And for us, as we're creating these maps, it then becomes the question of, well, how can we debunk some of these myths uh, once we get some more clear, because right now, who knows what the facts are. Um, but once we get some clear medical scientific facts around things, like let's say, um, let's say we find out that COVID-19 can't be transferred via food. I'm making this up. Uh, if that is the case, then what kind of job are we doing to communicate to fans along the way that at our concession stands, hey, you can't get coronavirus from this concession stand, right? Um, and that might be something that we have to take into consideration at each touch point. Um, as it relates to creating a new type of fan, I think one tip that I would give is look back at the last recession that we had back uh, in 2008, 2009, and look at how consumer behaviors change there. Obviously, it's a little bit different. That was mainly financial, whereas this is more public health and safety uh, changed, but you can start to see some of the behavior trends that happen in a recession, like people using coupons more or uh, people going and being more price sensitive as opposed to uh, brand uh, ha having that brand affinity purely because it's an influencer brand, right? Um, so you can then adjust based on some of those past behaviors. Um, but I, I don't necessarily know that we're going to have a completely new fan. I just think all of our old fans are going to have additional considerations. Sure. So with all of the old fans, um, you talked a little bit about creating products or services for those specific people instead of, you know, the average fan. So with those different 
groups, how do you decide which customer persona is most important to please maybe, or even how to prioritize, how to rank them um, in terms of where you put your money and new products and services, how to, you know, please these mm -hmm. different specific people? So at the very end, we'll, we'll get into kind of like a feasibility met matrix. So how you decide to pursue these, which of these new goals, you're going to come up with 30 new things when you go through this process. And that'll give you a better idea of how to prioritize which ideas you implement. Um, but as it relates to picking the fan, um, I, I'm, I tend to be more on the, the modal side of things. So look at your fan, go into your ticket data and see who the most amount of fans are. So if the most amount of fans that, that you have are single game ticket buyers, then focus in on the single game ticket buying experience, right? Um, some other, you don't have to just look at it from tickets though. That's just one kind of main filter. Another, another filter would be where are they coming from, right? So if you think about it as concentric circles, um, you might have within a, within a 30 mile radius, you've got X amount of fans within a hundred mile radius within the whole state, you've got people coming in and that's another percentage of your fans. And then just regionally overall, you've got people coming in for events. What percentage of those fans are they? And so that's another lens that you can look at. Ultimately, the way to do it is you wanna have the most bang for your buck. When you create a new thing, you want it to impact the most amount of people or have the most return on investment um, when you make it financially. So I, I would either look at who your most valuable fans are or who the most of your fans are um, and tackle it that way. When you, then when you, even like, even if you take season ticket holders within a 30 mile radius that you determine that is your most populous group of fans. Um, even when you do that, you're still gonna have to make up a persona that doesn't apply to every person and that's okay. Um, but you wanna get some of the basic, just the basic filters in there. How, how would you suggest um, analyzing that for smaller schools, you know, division three schools where ticket sales might not be at the forefront and some sports might not be ticketed at all? How do you, you know, analyze the data for those fans? Honestly, I think that's to a degree, it can be easier because you have more direct access and you probably have a relationship with them. So I remember um, when we were, when I was back at Disney Institute and we were creating the, uh, we were working with D3 on, on some of the service standards and conflict resolution type stuff. And as we created that, right, the issue was that if you're in D3 and a, a parent or a fan starts yelling things at a ref, um, you can hear that all throughout the arena. And so I think when you are in a, a D3 or a smaller school, you probably have easier access to go tap into those customers and figure out who they are. Um, you don't have to have the hard data. You can use anecdotal data. Um, and to make up that persona. Um, so even if you don't have the ticket data, you're probably looking, if you've been at your school for a couple of years at least, um, you can look at it and know, hey, most of our fans, these are their behaviors. Um, these are their eating out habits. Uh, we know they probably come to half of our games, right? Use rough estimations. This is not meant to be don't let the science and the data slow you down from creating these things. You can create them anecdotally. It's just more accurate uh, when you're looking at a large scale. Like if you've got a hundred stadium that has 80,000 people in it, you want to try, the, the decisions are going to have more impact, if you will, financially. So you want to be a little bit more scientific. But um, otherwise, use your anecdotal, or anecdotal data and make your best guesses. Okay, I have just a couple more for this section. Um, yeah. This one's kind of more in your opinion, but do you think that bringing up COVID to the fans um, when we do return to game day via PA announcement or signage, something like that, will be beneficial or create fear? Depends on how you do it. Um, I would say for you to ignore it is dumb. This is just my personal take on this. I mean, people naturally, right now we are all in our houses because we are fearful of being within six feet of each other. Um, and for us to then ask fans to, hey, six months from now, three months from now, two months from now, whatever it is, come pack into this sardine can of an arena or a baseball stadium or whatever it might be. Um, and for us not to acknowledge that just feels wrong, right? I would want to be acknowledged for that. Um, so the question is how you do it. Um, so, uh, you know, I was, I was talking with um, the, the EVP of ASM Global, who oversees all their stadium and arenas uh, and theaters worldwide. 
And the conversation we were having was at each touch point in the journey, what's the PPE that our people are gonna be wearing? And what are the signs and clear communication that we're saying that you know, you can't get COVID-19 by doing X, Y, Z, whatever this ticket interaction is. Like, let's say we're scanning our tickets, right? And it's contactless. Feel free to advertise like, hey, we've got contactless digital ticketing where you can come back in so you don't have to have that interaction, right? Play it up. Uh, be as clear and transparent as you can with your communications. I hope That's that great. answers. I hope that so answers. Yeah, definitely. Um, one last question. Um, you mentioned in the beginning um, how we can tailor this to um, different parts of the athletic department, not just fans. So for those who are working in student athlete development and academic services um, and, you know, more folks on the internal side, how do we incorporate this? Yeah, so it's the same thing. Like, let, let's let's call it student athletes. It's actually this is the hardest to do for employees. I'm not going to lie, because part of part of creating personas, um, it's about role play. It's about taking off your lens and putting yourself in the shoes of somebody so it's it takes saying all right if i was Susie's soccer mom how would i go through this and to do that as an employee when you are an employee is really hard um because it, it it's it's hard to remove your own biases considering you are somebody that we could be looking at so the the fear comes up of like well why are we focusing on this employee and not my type of employee Right? Why are we focusing on senior leaders? I'm a middle manager, and, and I feel like we have tons of issues. Um, it's hard to, it, it's it's harder uh, to step into that role play. But for student athletes, I think this is a super valuable tool. Right, being able to say, okay, who is our our target student athlete that we want? Right, what are they? What are their reading habits? Um, what are their, uh, what's their family background, right? Uh, and again, you're not publicizing this, you're not broadcasting this, this is purely internal. Um, but as, as, your, as your teams and your coaches create their own culture as for, this is the type of student athlete we want representing our school, it's really important to make up that customer persona. So that way, when you're going out and you're recruiting customer or you're, re you're recruiting student athletes, you kind of got a better fit, a uh, better feel for what type of people you should be bringing in, if that makes sense. Um, and you can do that by looking at your current student athletes that you have uh, at your organization and in your department right now. Um, and again, this you can apply this process from the recruiting process to the time that they're actually on campus for four years, right? Um, it, it, it all fits just as well with student athletes. Good, great stuff. Well, I think um, you know we have about 15 minutes left, so we can go ahead and move on to the third section. All right, so I'm gonna whip through this um, and we'll leave it for questions. Um, so the last part about this is journey map. So great, we've got a con uh, customer persona. How do we actually plan out our, our operation? All right, so customer journey mapping. Ultimately what this is, it's, it's a visual representation for what it looks like on game day, right? This is what, this piece right here is really what bridges the gaps between sales, marketing and operations. So what you're going to do is at the top, you're going to have stages, okay? On the left-hand side, you're going to have the different things like the emotions, the fears. This is where you might add a column in here that says, um, what is the education at each touch point we're doing to prevent COVID-19 or to prevent people's fears for COVID-19, right? Um, we'll talk about that in a second, but it should be this kind of visual thing where it's mixed between graphs and you can add a picture you, you can add a picture row that says okay what does it look like at every step of the way visually with a picture what does our parking look lot look like where's the picture of that what does the concession stand look like where's the picture for that um, you really kind of want to map it out like this and then it's easy for people that weren't involved in the process to understand how you came to the decision that you came to all right, um, so this is super tiny uh, because these maps can get gigantic and really hard to put on a slide. But if you squint real close and you can see in here the top row here, we kind of have broken this up and this is a one you could use with your customers on game day um, into some different stages and sub stages. And we'll talk about that here uh, on the next slide. Um, but ultimately, you're coming at this still from the same customer point of view. So on the left-hand side, you see the persona name, right? So what this journey looks like for donor Dave is going to look very different 
than it looks like for Susie's soccer mom, right? This is also where you want to incorporate some KPIs or some of that data, the key performance indicators. And ultimately, you're going to want to visualize. Uh, it helps really visualize the entire journey for anybody else. All right, so actually building your map. This is a little better view of that top piece. So start with your top tiles or your top titles first. You're going to have stages, which if you see here on the left, it's pre-game, in-stadium, right? You might have pre-arrival. You might have post-game on there as your stages. And then underneath, you're going to have a bunch of sub-stages. So those sub-stages of pre-game might be parking, tailgating, fan activities, like a fan fest maybe, um, gate entry. Those are all things that are in pregame. And then in the stadium, you've got food and beverage, merchandise, guest amenities. What's the in-game entertainment look like? What are the con How dirty are the concourses? What do the restrooms look like? Um, so we listed some of these in here. Uh, and if you want, just take a picture of this, right? We'll have the slides up later, I think, Dana. Um, but yeah, these are some things to get you started as you map out those stages first. The next thing is on the left. Here are some things that when we're mapping out um, a customer journey for a game day, uh, here are some of the things that you might do. And this act, this same thing works for this for student athletes, um, employees, you might wanna put an extra row or two in there. Um, but ultimately you're gonna have, what are the goals of that person? So uh, you're gonna have, what are the expectations? So another way to think about the difference between goals and expectations, you might think about it as, needs versus wants so your expectations might be the needs i need a clean bathroom or i need a bathroom right my goal might be i want to have a clean bathroom with no line that makes sure there's a tv there so that when i leave my seat i'm not missing any action right so goals versus expectations there you want to put the actual process of what that looks like right is it if you're talking about food and beverage on there i see is it a you got to stand in the concession stand line is it, uh, what's the queue line process look like? How is it, or is it getting delivered via a mobile app, right? What's the actual process there? Then with these smiley faces, right? You can say, is it a good experience? Is it a bad experience? Um, what are the channels that they're engaging with it? Pictures of it, quotes, what are they saying? These are the two, that's, this is the piece that we wanted to add in here is what are their health and safety fears at each section, right? Can we put extra hand sanitizers by every, concession stand, right? Think, get in your, put yourself in the shoes of the consumer. We all have the same fears right now of getting COVID-19. So at every step of the way, what would your health and safety fears be, right? And mapping that out and physically actually writing that down. By doing this now that you've got your stages, you can start to identify what are the specific problems in each of these based on what our person's goals are. We know what they expect. We know what they want where are the roadblocks between those two things, right? And then you can start to think of, okay, what are the ideas and opportunities? We'll give you some tools to come up with those. All right, so identifying pain points, right? Um, how do we do that? Uh, can't stress it enough, get into the point of view of the customer there. What are their goals and emotions each step of the way? Then what are the roadblocks to their goals? What's standing in that way? I'll give you an example. Um, we'll use Susie Soccer Mom and we'll use tailgating. Um, let's say you're, you're tailgating. Susie Soccer Mom's goal is to provide a great family experience, right? So a pain point might be she's parked right next to the fraternity party where all the drunk college kids are continuously running into their space and she doesn't feel safe with the kids, right? Might be an example. Um, but an additional way to just improve on it, let's say that's not happening and there's no eminent bad pain points, you might just say, well, if her goal is to create a great family experience in that tailgate spot for her kids, what if she doesn't have any tailgate games like cornhole or, um, I don't know, the, the game where you toss the rope onto the, the ladder, right? Um, could you create a spot where you rent those tailgate things? Or what if she runs out of solo cups? Right, but she can't, and she can't back out of that spot to go get solo cups because she's already parked. Can you have a cart that goes around and sells forgotten items and get that then sponsored? Right. Um, so ultimately, you want to look at what are the roadblocks, and how can we create uh, how can we create uh, benefits and turn those roadblocks into positives. The challenging part when you're going through the map is not to do your own point of view. 
again, stay in the customer's shoes. It's going to be really easy for you to say um, behind and call out behind the scenes things as to what's causing the pain, but don't do that. Stick at it with what does the customer see? And then on the back end, you'll be able to fix those things. Um, if you're really struggling, just call some of your fans and say, hey, can I take you out to coffee? Right now, everybody's doing Zoom with people that they've never connected with, or not never, but haven't connected with in years, right? Call up some of your fans and just say, hey, we want to do a Zoom with a couple of you guys. And zero in on specific points of the customer journey map where you're feeling like you have a deficit of information and dive into those things. Don't just ask them, how can we make this better for you, right? Dive into the specific questions that you have from their point of view. Uh, use that time with them to get to know them better. Um, all right, uh, so here's how you identify, here's how you start to identify the types of opportunities you're looking for. Um, they're, they're what's called, honestly, moments of truth. Um, so they're the, they're the key points in that customer journey that dictate whether or not a fan is going to return and tell their friends or whether they're never coming back and they're ranting about you on Facebook and sending you a nasty message, right? And they're different for every fan base and for every sport. Um, so the way to think about it is between pits peaks and potholes. Um, first, you want to go after your pits, right? So what are the things that are just glaringly bad that people uh, people always complain about and we see people not coming back because of that, right? Tackle those things first. Get your pits up to just okay moments. You don't have to turn your pits into peaks. That can be intimidating, but turn your pits into acceptable moments. Then you want to look at your peaks. What are those really high moments? And what are the circumstances behind the scenes that allow for those peaks to occur? How can you then replicate those situations or circumstances at other points throughout the journey? Because you want people to feel that surprise and delight throughout. Um, my biggest thing here and my biggest caution is don't worry about the potholes. It's going to be really tempting to just fix that one small thing um, that that people complain about here and there that you know is a pain it's pretty easy to get it fixed so you say oh maybe if we fix a ton of potholes um it'll work and yeah that that could be the case um but you're better off picking a couple pits and peaks and tackling those things whereas potholes don't really make that big of a difference people learn how to your fans know how to take shortcuts around those potholes right um if you've got all the time in the world yeah let, and you've got all the resources yeah let's build let's fill in all those potholes but otherwise, your fans know how to circumnavigate those things. All right, some questions that really will allow you to come up with the better ideas when you're looking at problems. Um, the way to solve them is to think about it, frame all of these problems and all of these challenges as how might we fix X or how might we go about doing X, Y, Z. Um, if you put how might we in front, it changes it from being a negative to being an opportunity. And the same thing with what if, that'll get you out of your box, out of your river of thinking. Um, so we had a, a guest on our podcast uh, named Duncan Wardle, who is the head of, former head of imagination or innovation and creativity from Disney. And uh, he talked about what if as, you know, when Walt Disney was creating Disneyland, part of what they did was they looked at the theaters and they couldn't, Walt couldn't control the smell that was coming out of the theaters. He couldn't control, he wanted, he said, what if our, our characters could come out of the screen. Well, we wouldn't be able to do that in a theater. We'd have to build a physical place, right? So what if is gonna help you get out of your, your box of thinking? When you've got a finished product, it looks something like this. Um, it's heavy, it's in depth, but when you look at it and you dive in, people will be able to understand how you came to that decision-making process. Then as a bonus, um, if you find you've just got too many ideas, use this feasibility matrix. It's really simple. You can do it on a napkin. It doesn't have to be exact science. Look at what is the user value versus the effort by the organization. That could be financial effort. That could be time effort, whatever it might be. And you want to target things in the top right corner, things that have high user value uh, and that have low effort by the organization. Those are really the things that you want to go ahead and tackle. Potholes don't have a ton of user value, right? even though they might be easy to fix. All right, I think we're done. Um, Dana, what do we got? Um, let's see, what are some creative ways uh, to capture consumer and fan data that doesn't seem 
like too much that we're digging into their personal information? Um, I wish I could have a little bit more clarity on that. You want to stay away from the things that you know are going to get you in trouble, right? Um, you want to have it be more tailored towards what you're trying to do. Um, so if you go out and have a cup of coffee, right, people are going to tell you what they think. And um, you can ask questions that if you just say, hey, I'm just trying to understand how we fit into your life. Um, by starting it with that question, I'm trying to understand how we can fit into your life and help you with what you're trying to do in life. If you start it with that, they're going to open it up um, and they're not going to feel like you're prying. I think the other thing too, is that this is college sports. Like people have tattoos of your brand in some cases uh, on, on their body. Like a regular consumer product does not have that loyal fan base. Your fans will be surprisingly open and honest with you um, and they'll give you probably more than you need to know sometimes uh, if you just ask if you personally take the time to call them up right and and have that conversation i think where you can get in trouble is when you send out a big blanket survey to your entire fan base and don't clarify really the reasoning for it with some of the stickier questions, you're almost better off. It's, it sounds counterintuitive, but it sounds better. It it actually is better off doing it one on one, where you can actually build a relationship and explain what what you're doing with that information, rather than trying to put that all into a mass survey. Um, so I guess that would be my answer to that. Yeah, that's good. That makes sense. Um, okay, one more question. Um, if you know, we go ahead and do these journey maps. Do we need one for each sport or do they carry over? Is it, you know, specific to each facility? How does that work? It can get really overwhelming because ultimately you have so many services and products, so many experiences, so many offerings. Um, so what I would say is start with your, I, I hate to say this, but start with your biggest sport um, because that journey map is probably going to have ripple effects down the way. Right. Um, so if, you know, you're talking about third party operators, uh, whether they be ushers or security staff, or whatever it might be, those same ushers and security staff are probably working your other events, too. There just happens to be more of them at your bigger uh, events. Additionally, your bigger events are going to have more touch points. Um, so by tackling the biggest one first, uh, you're going to be able to really have a clearer thing. And then you can just kind of copy paste a lot of the things you've already created from the first one onto those next sports. Great. Okay. I lied. One more question. Okay. Um, do you have, do you have tips on, you know, wording for correspondence when fans reach out to cancel their season tickets at this point? Um, you know, just how and how can we hope to keep them following the teams at least or, you know, continue to attend in the future if they take the season off? Okay, so a couple things on that. If somebody if somebody cancels their season ticket um, and one, if you're a smaller school and you kind of have a, somewhat of a relationship with that person, I mean, the best thing you can do in a lot of cases is actually reach out to them and say, hey, we want to make sure that um, – we're being the best partner for you as you can. I noticed you've been a season ticket holder for five years now. Um, I see it. I, we can go ahead and process this cancellation. Is there anything else, any other way that we can help you? Right. Um, and most of the time they're going to say no and they're just going to can hit cancel. But a lot of times the problem is when they hit cancel and you just say, send back a blanket, okay, your cancellation has been processed. They're going to go tell their friends, like, Hey, I've been a season ticket for holder for five years and uh, they just sent me back like, a, okay, like as if I don't matter, right? It's kind of like the whole, even if you don't get invited, even if you weren't planning on going to a party, but you don't get invited, you still get upset about it. It's the, the same kind of feeling happens with this. So reach out and find out ways that you can help. And sometimes by doing that, they might respond. A small percentage of them might respond and say, hey, yeah, let's talk, right? Um, and you might be able to sell them uh, a, a multi-game pack instead of a season pack, uh, and you can keep them engaged, right? But I think a lot of times it's just keep your humanity about you in all this, right? Know that people are going to be losing their jobs. We're going to have unemployment at an all-time high. Um, know that this is going to be the case, and 
just reach out to people, make sure they're doing okay in all this. And that's going to be the best way to keep them engaged is if they feel like you did them right through this process and that you had their back, they're going to be way more loyal to you than trying to be like, okay, we'll still go follow all of our pages, right? That doesn't do anything for them. Um, so just keep your humanity and like be good people through this. It's, it's, it's the simplest advice, but like that's what great customer experience and customer service is, is just having empathy and, and being a human, human in this uh, as we all go through this together. Absolutely. What a great message to end on. Thank you, David, again, for lending your time and expertise to all of our NAFTA and affiliates members today. We appreciate you and everything you've done for associations over the years. And thank you, members, again, for joining us. And we hope to see you on another session very soon. Take care. Cool. Yeah. And Dana, one more thing before we shut it down. Um, on uh, If you go to engagementpartners.com backslash NACTA, we put up a, a download there so you can grab just, I think we've got like 20 or so cards that'll help you really dig into building your own personas. Um, and through this time, like we, we've created a, a digital way that where we can help you go through all this stuff uh, in what we're calling an experience design sprint. And we run it all virtually via Zoom and some of our virtual whiteboard tools. Um, and so if you go to our website, you can get a hold of us through that. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you uh, setting this all up, Dana, and appreciate everybody for tuning in. Great. Thank you, everybody. Take care.